Let's read responsively our call to worship from Psalm 73. I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Would you pray with me, please? God, we praise you because you are our strength and our shield, our portion forever. For you are the great creator who flung the stars into space. And by your very words, creation came out of nothing. We praise you, Father God. We praise you, God the Son. For you emptied yourself and became a servant and were obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Lord Jesus, you are highly exalted and given the name above every name that at your name every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that you are Lord. Holy Spirit, you are the Lord and giver of life. You touched us and enabled us to respond to the truth of God. And not only did you give us abundant and eternal life, but you continue to work in us to accomplish your will and purpose. We praise you, triune God, for you are great and good. And we make our prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to ask uh, De Beverly to pray, play through this song one time so that you can get the tune. And let's stand and sing it together.
talking this morning about the purpose of life. And when I mentioned that to a few friends, they said, how many hours is this sermon going to be? Uh, I hope it'll be the usual length. But our confession of sin focuses on the fact that we often live without thinking about the greater purpose that God has for our lives. So let's confess our sins together and then we'll take time for individual and private confession. Let's pray. We confess, Lord, that we often live without thinking of your purpose for our lives. We do that which pleases us rather than that which pleases you. We recognize that this is sin. Forgive us, Father, and help us to live purpose-driven lives in which love for you and love for others is our driving force. For Christ's sake, amen. Let's continue to confess our sins silently. Let us pray. Amen. The first time that John the Baptist is recorded as speaking in the Gospel of John, he says to his followers as Jesus passes by, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Brothers and sisters, because of your faith in the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, I declare you are forgiven. Let's join together and sing the Lamb of God. Please be seated. This time in the service is a time where we give thanks and also intercede. If you've been getting the regular mailings from Mandy on Wednesday and sometimes Friday, you know that we have many, many needs in our congregation, among our families, friends, uh, even neighbors. So I'm going to give a time during this prayer where you can 
lift up some particular person that needs to be interceded for. And let's pray together. My Father and our God, we are thankful today that you are a God who hears and answers prayer. We thank you that we are not talking to ourselves, to one another, to these walls, but we are talking to the greatest power in the universe. And that you are able, Lord, to do far more abundantly than anything we can even ask or think. And so we ask, Lord, that we might see wondrous things in your word and wondrous things in your world. For this is our Father's world. You sent Jesus not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through our Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for your saving work. And thank you that we can know lives that have meaning. Lord, we pray today for our nation, for our world, in which so many people are lost. We pray for those in power, in government, that they would in fact be looking to you. Lord, we give thanks for the legislature of South Carolina and the governor who have set into motion into action a bill to eliminate abortion after a fetal heartbeat. And Father, we pray that that bill would pass the courts, that it would not be overruled, and that it might become a groundswell within our nation of new respect for the life of unborn children. We grieve over abortion, and we pray, Lord, that our Supreme Court might even overrule Roe versus Wade. Lord, thank you for your church, that we are part of a great Catholic church, universal, that men and women and children all over the world are hearing good news this very day. And we thank you that the gospel is prospering in Africa, in Asia, even in Muslim countries. And we pray for those who are courageously proclaiming the truth in lands in which it's dangerous to do so. Sustain them by your Holy Spirit, Lord, we ask. And help us to support in prayer and in giving those efforts. And now, Father, we turn our hearts toward home, toward this congregation, and to our wider influence among family and friends and neighbors, many of whom need your healing touch, many of whom need to know you as Lord and Savior, Jesus. Hear our individual prayers now as we remember at least one person that we know who is hurting and in need physically, spiritually, emotionally, or even relationally. Let us pray to the Lord. Thank you, Father, that you not only hear our prayers, but you delight in our prayers. We pray them in the strong name of Jesus, and let God's people say, Amen. Amen. We'll wait on you now for God's tithes and our offerings.
face of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Father, we praise you for the wonderful grace of Jesus. I think of the great theologian Jonathan Edwards who said, I received Jesus as Savior as a young man and the rest of my life was spent saying thank you. And we say thank you to you, Lord, because you are the giver of every good and perfect thing. We thank you for the way you've blessed us financially and we thank you for the opportunity to worship you through tithes and offerings. Use them to spread the gospel worldwide, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Our confession of faith this morning should be familiar to many of you. It's very brief, but it is the uh, first question in the Westminster Confession of Faith Shorter Catechism. What is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Today's scripture is Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17. Put on then as God chosen one, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, 
bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdoms, singing faith, phrases and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God our Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I began preaching regularly in February of 1978. And so I have files of more than 40 years worth of sermons. Um, that's a lot. But as I went through my files recently, I realized that I've preached a sermon on every book of the Bible except one, Ecclesiastes. I haven't purposely avoided it, but it is a difficult book. Nevertheless, it is the Word of God. And I happened to be reading a magazine last year, and they named the book of the year, the biblical book of the year, called, it's called Living Life Backward, written by a pastor named David Gibson. And it's a study of Ecclesiastes. And that further prompted me to want to preach on this book because it's an excellent book. And the thesis of the book is that Solomon is writing Ecclesiastes at the end of his life. And he is looking back at life, living life backwards from the perspective of death and trying to consider what really matters. That's the reason I entitled this first message. It's based on the first chapter of Ecclesiastes, perhaps the most depressing of all the chapters in Ecclesiastes. What is the purpose of life? Listen to the Word of God as we find it in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. The words of the preacher, the Hebrew word is koaleth, and in Hebrew, it, this book is called Koaleth, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuit the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear with hear, filled with hearing. What has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, See, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of latter things yet to be among those who come after. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. 
I perceive that this also is but a striving after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. This is the word of the Lord. Just a little bit of quick background, as you know, Solomon was the king after his father David. He built the great temple, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And as he was building that, God said, ask me for anything and I will give it. And Solomon didn't ask God for riches, although he became the richest person perhaps in all of history. He said, Lord, give me wisdom. And so God said, I'll not only give you wisdom, I'll give you all the rest, including, I don't believe, hundreds of wives. And therein lies the problem. I really have difficulty keeping one wife happy. <laughs> and she is not high maintenance by any means. Those foreign wives that Solomon often married for political purposes brought in foreign gods and corrupted the worship of Israel. And so, the wisdom Solomon was given became folly. The main thesis of this message is this, that life seems empty until and unless we discover the real purpose of life. The word that is repeated in the first chapter over and over again is the Hebrew word hebel, which is translated in this Translation, vanity, in the New International Version, it's meaningless. Other translations translated as empty. It refers to smoke or a mist or a vapor, something that goes away quickly, that vanishes. Solomon's saying that Unless we know the real purpose of life, so much of it seems like a mist. It's empty. It's meaningless. He describes here that life is like a continual cycle going nowhere. That really is the position of Eastern religion, an endless recycling of life, reincarnation. What a depressing religion <laughs> to believe that you may come back as a snail or if you're really good, a cow. Do you ever feel like that? What's the use? What's the use? Everything stays the same. I think that's one of Satan's most powerful weapons against us is that flaming dart that suggests that we really aren't that important to God. He also wants us to believe that life is unsatisfying. Everything seems old and boring. One of the most well-known phrases from Ecclesiastes is, there's nothing new under the sun. Now you may respond to that and say, seriously, Solomon? Have you ever heard about computers? We live in a digital age where there's new discoveries over and over again, but the point of Ecclesiastes 1 is it's communication. The means may vary, but it's still much the same. We're attempting to communicate, which is something that we were made to do. Man seems insignificant. <clears throat> Nothing we do really makes much of a difference. I can't get no satisfaction. That was the anthem of the Rolling Stones, and if you look at their life closely, you can see emptiness, vanity. Guys who are 70 look like they're about 130.
We're restless. If we don't believe that there's a greater purpose in life, that life is unsatisfying, we go from one thing to another. If you don't believe people are restless, watch a guy with a TV remote. And then Solomon is suggesting that life is uncontrollable. Sooner or later, each of us comes to the place in their life where we have to acknowledge that our life is beyond our own control. Shelley wrote a great poem. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look upon my works, ye mighty, and what is it? <laughs> despair. Despair. Look upon my works in despair because why? You're not as important as I am. The irony, of course, is that that statue of Ozymandias was found in the desert. It was buried in the sand. It was decayed. And nobody's really sure who Ozymandias was. The king of kings. The mighty one. The more we know, the, m the more we seem to be unhappy, Solomon says. For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. I think about three of the smartest people of the 20th century. Sigmund Freud, Friedrich Nietzsche, a German philosopher, Jean-Paul Sartre, all brilliant minds and all people who saw no purpose in life. All atheists to the core. Jean-Paul Sartre really summed up their philosophy when he said, the only real question is whether to commit suicide or not. Life is meaningless without a greater purpose. People try to achieve a greater purpose in their lives. I think there are a number of attempts that people make. <clears throat> One is that people who try to find something in their life to be the center of their life. We all have that God-shaped vacuum, Pascal said. And many people try to fill it with other things. Money, possessions, hobbies, sports, pleasure. I knew a guy in South Florida who said to me, I live to sail. I work, I make money so that I can pursue my passion, which is sailing. He was not a happy guy, despite his sailing. I'm going to escape the rat race is another attempt to find meaning. We are the most addictive society in history. And people try to find meaning by escape into drugs, into food, alcohol, sex, entertainment. All attempts to dull the pain and escape, but they never work. The only answer to what is a spiritual and eternal problem is a spiritual and eternal solution. Bill read about it in Colossians chapter 3. It's all through the New Testament. The purpose of life, the purpose of life is Jesus Christ. We said it in our confession of faith. Our chief end 
is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. One of my favorite writers, John Piper, rephrased that and he said, the chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying Him forever. I think that's really the truth of Scripture. Paul's summary statement in verse 17 is, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, that is a purpose statement which worth living for. Can I say what I'm about to say or what I'm about to do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him? If not, I should not say it, I should not do it. Of course, the only way that we can live that statement is if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord by faith. Have you trusted in Him? Really trusted in Him as your Lord and Savior this morning? If so, you have a life's purpose. Not only do you have abundant and eternal life, but you have the power through God the Holy Spirit, who we talked about recently, to make a difference in the world that God has given you. Paul tells us that we can make a difference by forgiving others in the name of Jesus Christ. How are we to forgive? As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Does God demand that we ask forgiveness 7, 8, 12, 15 times? We grovel. We promise to never do it again? No. All we have to do is say, forgive me, and the Lord is quick to forgive. We need to do the same. I have done, I estimate, over 500 weddings in almost 50 years as an ordained minister. And in every one of those weddings, I try to share this message from Colossians 3.13. I tell the couple, you probably don't believe this because you got stars in your eyes right now, but you are marrying a sinner. And I guarantee you, the longer you're married, the more you'll say amen to that statement. When someone hurts us, when someone sins against us, like we do in marriage, like we do in friendships, like we do even with our neighbors, it can't be undone. It can only be confessed and forgiven. I always conclude that by saying a great marriage is composed of two great forgivers, as is a good friendship. Paul tells us also that because of the Spirit's power in our lives, we can love others in the name of Jesus. Love binds everything together in perfect harmony. If your life's purpose is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, your life will count for all eternity. Because when the Apostle Paul describes love in 1 Corinthians 13, he concludes with this statement. Three things abide, three things last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Our love for God and our love for, for others will continue for all eternity. It binds everything together in perfect harmony. And Paul tells us that we are to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. That word rule actually is taken from sports. Let it be the umpire in your heart, making the decision for peace. We talked recently about the fact that biblical peace is not the absence of conflict, but it is the presence of Christ in the midst of difficult circumstances. 
Peace is a fruit of the Holy Spirit that comes from abiding in Christ. We need to ask ourselves, peace is harmony with God, with others, and within ourselves. Is what I'm about to say or do going to produce harmony with my brother or sister? And finally, the purpose of life is made very clear in the Word of God, written, the Scriptures. Paul says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Not only are we to read God's Word, memorize God's Word, we're to live God's Word. Paul says that it happens in worship. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. That's worship. That is worship, which enables us to glorify God. But it doesn't end there. Our lives are to be lives of worship glorifying God in whatever we do. I am preparing this meal to the glory of God by serving my family. I am playing golf to the glory of God to worship Him through His creation and by showing my fellow players the Spirit of Christ when I make a bad shot. I am glorifying God by writing this email to encourage my brother or sister. When we discover the real purpose in life, it is abundant and eternal. It is the furthest thing from meaningless. Would you pray with me? Lord God, thank you that you have shown us through Scripture the emptiness of life without you. We know that because we were there, most of us. We were in darkness until the light of Christ opened our eyes. But we thank you, Lord, that not only do we have a purpose for living, we have the power to live out your purpose in our lives. Lord, show us how to do that, especially in our day-to-day -day living. For we ask it together in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing together our closing hymn, Be Thou My Vision, number 83.
the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine down upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.